Okay, guys, I'm here for my sixth review in the Great American Bash review series. This is the Great American Bash 1995. It's re the Great American Bash returned after a two-year absence, or a three-year absence, technically, but two Great American Bash absence, in a way. Those I brought this back to make a full, to make... So they have two summer pay-per-views because they wanted to cut back on how many Clash of Champions they do during the year. So, that was all about time when the WWE had started their In Your House system. They I got they got the end of their 12 pay-per-views per year schedule. So, the Great American Bash 1995 came back after what was essentially a three-year uh, three year absence. And it took place in June, first time it was placed in June, June the 16th, 1995, from the Hera Arena in Dayton, Ohio. The only time that this event has ever been in Ohio. And in case you're wondering, uh, I lived about an hour or so from Dayton in this time. But since that was Father's Day and my dad wasn't the biggest wrestling fan in the world, uh, I declined to go to this event. I've never, I, I never went to an OCW pay-per-view. I've been to one wrestling pay-per-view in my life. I was back last show six. Other than that, it's been either Raws or House shows. I've never gone, and I never went to a WCW pay-per-view. So, and this was the closest one to me that I ever could have went to, besides sold out 2000. So, this is an eight-match card, although I only consider seven of these matches, but it's an eight-match card. Our opening contest is Fine Brian versus Alex Wright in what is the match of the night. It's a very good match. It's three and a half stars. Uh, right wins with a, uh, crossbody, with a, uh, Pillman goes, I, I don't know what Pillman's trying to do. Right try goes for a crucifix, or Pillman tries to go for a crucifix or something. Right drops down and gets a pin. Uh, three and a half stars. Uh, Pillman was a subtle heel in a way here, which would set up for things later on down the road in 95. Uh, so, three and a half stars, Alex Wright won. So then we get an arm wrestling contest. Yes, on pay-per-view arm wrestling. Arm wrestling is boring to watch. Why would you put it on here? It's Diamond Dallas Page versus Dave Sullivan, and the stipulations are this. If Diamond Dallas Page wins, then Diamond Dallas Page gets Dave Sullivan's pet rabbit, Ralph. And if Dave Sullivan wins, he wins a day with the Diamond Doll. And Dave Sullivan wins when, uh... The Diamond Doll knocks Max Muscle into DDP, which make, which allows Dave Sullivan to win. Uh, since this is more of an angle and something that belongs basically on TV, even though Nitro didn't exist, zero stars. If you're going to do this, do this on WCW Saturday Night or WCW Worldwide or Main Event. You know, something that is before the pay-per-view. Because other than that, it's a time waster. Zero stars because it's not a wrestling match. So then we get Hacksaw Jim Duggan filling in for Marcus Bagwell. As he's taking on Sergeant Craig Pittman. Oh, yeah. Half a star here. Uh, Duggan wins by DQ when uh, Pittman locks in his code red arm breaker. And Duggan gets the roast, but Pittman refuses to uh, break the hold. Half a star. So then we get a bonus match that was made on the main event prior to this. As it's Harlem Heat versus Bunkhouse Buck and Dick Slater. Uh, one and a half star tag match. Harlem Heat win when the finishing sequence is Booker T's got Bunkhouse Buck in a small package. Colonel Parker rolls Bunkhouse Buck into the small package. Sherry rolls Booker T back into the small package. And that gets the win for Harlem Heat. Uh, one and a half stars. In case you're wondering, by Fall Brawl, the... Two pay-per-views from now, Dick Slater and Monkhouse Buck would be the World Tag Team Champions. <laughs> yeah, don't ask me why, I don't know either, but I'll get to that with Fall with the Fall Brawl 95 review, or at least around there, because they lost the title, I think, before that show, but I'm not entirely sure. So then we get, oh boy, this match. The WCW World Television Championship match, Arn Anderson versus The Renegade, which I believe I talked about The Renegade in the Uncensored 1995 review, but in case I didn't, The Renegade was basically WCW trying to rip off The Ultimate Warrior, and they hired a guy who had less charisma than The Ultimate Warrior, and ironically, knew less about wrestling than The Ultimate Warrior. 
He does three moves in this match. A sleeper, an abdominal stretch, and a splash off the top rope. And he does like a couple sleepers or something like that. Mine is, I think, like a clothesline and a shoulder tackle. So, they even gave him Warrior's finishing move just off the top rope. This is a bad match. R. Anderson has said this is the only bad match he's ever had in his life, I think. The Renegade was failed. I'm glad after and after he lost the championship at Fall Brawl 95, we never really saw this idiot again. So, WWE learned about this idiot after this, and we never saw him again after he lost the championship, pretty much. He did eventually commit suicide and all that, and that's tragic, but this guy had no business being in a wrestling ring. No stars. It's, one of the, it's something that really holds this show down, because the other three matches are actually somewhat good. And our next match, WWE World Tag Team Championship match, Nasty Boys versus the Blue Bloods. Uh, two stars here. Uh, I love how they found a way to take Bobby Eaton, who's from Huntsville, Alabama, and somehow make him an English aristocrat in the storyline. <laughs> uh, this is an okay match. It's two stars. Finish shows when Bobby Eaton's going up for the move that used to be called the Alabama Jam. Booker T does the Harlem Hangover. As he's getting out of the ring, he trips up Eaton. Sags and comes off the top rope with an elbow, and then uh, Knobs covers. This led to a three-way match at Bash of the Beach 95, which I might review just because WCW uh, that day made no money off the gate because of the fact that was on a free public beach. <laughs> the fact that WCW held events where they could make no money off the gate is mind-boggling in a way. Because they have five events, technically, that they did never made any money off of at the gate. Bash of the Beach 95, and all four times they went to Sturgis for Hog Wild 96, and then Road Wild 97 through 99. They never made any gate off of that, because it was the show was included just by coming into the venue, just to the thing. So, they never made any money off at gates for those five events. So... So then we get the WWE United States Championship Tournament Final. Back in, all, back in April of 1995, Vader was stripped of the WCW US title due to an attack from Hacksaw Jim Duggan. But like, on Hacksaw Jim Duggan, but like I said, to my knowledge, he never defended the championship anyway, so I don't even know why they ever gave it to him anyway. So WWE made the 16-man tournament. Sting and Ming was actually a semi-final, but due to Ric Flair and Randy Savage getting double eliminated because they never got to the ring for their semi-final match because their feet it was going on, the semi-final between Sting and Ming became the final. So it's Sting versus Ming here, uh, three stars, Sting won with a jumping DDT, which added a little bit something different to this match. Uh, this was Ming's first loss in WCW, so there's that. Three stars, though. So then we get the main event, Macho Man Randy Savage versus Ric Flair. Now keep this in mind, Hulk Hogan and Vader are both in this arena. They found no way to put Hogan and Vader on this card for a WCW World Championship match. I would have taken off the Harlem Heat match and just put Hogan and Vader in here for a WCW World Ta Championship match if that was me. But I guess Hogan didn't want to work this pay-per-view. The only Great American Bash that I know of that Hawk Hogan worked was in 98 and 2000. Are the only two that I know he's on. So, that I know he's on. Uh, this was a thing that really started back at Slamboree of 95 when Ric Flair put the figure four on Angelo Poffo, who's out here with Randy Savage in it, uh, for this match. Uh, Savage and Flair have always had good matches. This is no exception. This is a good match. Uh, it's a three-star match with the finish coming when um, Ric Flair and Hanjo Poffo's cane and he cracks Randy Savage in uh, the head with it and he gets the win that way via pinfall. I should say that there's a sign in the audience that says Macho Bandis began in Ohio. Uh, for those people who don't know or have not followed or don't know much about what Randy Savage did before he be before he wrestled, uh, Randy Savage played baseball for the Cincinnati Reds. 
Uh, very briefly, but he was on the Cincinnati Reds baseball team for a very early time, I believe in the late 70s or early 80s. Uh, I could be wrong on that, though. But I do know he played for the Cincinnati Reds, and his rookie card, which is out there, I think is worth actually a good deal of money, but I could be wrong on that, too. Uh, so three matches here. Uh, so out of a possible 40 stars, this show gets a 13 and a half, which would make it a D plus show. Because if you took off the arm wrestling match and the World TV title match, you'd have a much better show. Because those two matches are here, they bring this show down. Next show is 1996 Great American Bash. That's actually a historic Great American Bash in a lot of ways. Because in a lot of ways... Uh, that was really the second shot in the Monday Night War, or the first shot, depending how you look at stuff. So, that, that'll be up either tomorrow or Friday, whenever I get a chance to upload it. Uh, so, like the 92 review, this will be in the Great American Rash Review series. Uh, if you like the video, like button down there, subscribe button down there, and thank you for watching.